Well, good evening, everybody. It's a joy to be in NYC tonight. I drove up today from near Lancaster, Pennsylvania. How many of you ever visited Amish country, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania? We live right there. We're very familiar with road apples. How many of you know what a road apple is? Uh, just a hint, don't eat them. They are horse exhaust, shall we say, to put it delicately. But we are not here to talk about road apples. We're here to talk about the state of the world. Where are we? How did we get here? Where are we going? These are very, very important questions because we are living in confusing times. Would you agree? We're living in troubling times. We're living in difficult times. We're living, even we can say, in dark times. Would you agree with me? How many, how many would say, yeah, this is a confusing time to be alive. It's a difficult time to be alive. But as Colin said, we're living in a time of great mercy, right? Where sin and confusion abounds, grace abounds all the more. In order to understand, though, how powerful and potent and hopeful that grace is, or we could say it this way, to understand how good the good news is, we also have to take an honest look at how bad the bad news is. Right? So that's what we're going to be doing first. We're going to try to shine a light on these confusing times. What is going on? How did it get this dark? Why is it this confusing? And then I want to paint a picture of hope, a vision of where I believe we are headed. And I handed out, as, or I had some friends hand out for me, as many of these as we had uh, I'm going to be following some of what I say in this book here tonight. So would you turn with me just to page one if you have it? Pull it out. I begin with a scripture verse that's going to kind of set the stage for everything I want to talk about here tonight. Jesus himself says the following. Page five, actually. Page five in, your, in the book if you have it. If your whole body is full of light and no part of it is in darkness, then your body will be as full of light as a lamp illuminating you with its brightness. These are one of, this is one of those scriptures where we hear it on a Sunday, you know, in the gospel reading, and we don't really know what it means. It kind of goes in one ear and out the other, and we just go on with our day. This verse, if we enter into what Jesus is saying here, it will explain to us the confusing times we are living in, and it will show us the way out of the darkness and confusion. So let's see if we can enter in. If your whole body is full of light and no part of it is in darkness. Look at the title of this little book. Eclipse of the body. It's the idea that our bodies are now in darkness. We don't know what our bodies mean. In fact, it's even worse than that. We think they mean nothing. We think in the modern world that the human body is meaningless. We have totally separated in the modern world the human body from human identity. Think about it. We live in a world, a culture that demands in law that you identify every body without identifying any body. What happens when you identify some body without reference to his or her body? You identify quite literally no Nobody, despite all this talk about identity in the modern world, we are very quickly becoming a culture of nobodies. And a culture of nobodies is a culture in the dark. We live in a world that says the body is meaningless, but then on the other hand, the church says, not only does your body have a meaning, but the human body reveals 
ultimate meaning. This is the proposal of the church. The human body reveals ultimate meaning. Christopher, what the heck are you talking about? I'm not tracking with you. I don't even know what you're saying. What do you mean the human body reveals ultimate meaning? What do you even mean? Okay, if you believe in Christmas, you believe that the human body reveals ultimate meaning because that's the Christmas story. That ultimate meaning itself, capital M, meaning, took on a human body, a male body born of a female body. It's always male and female together. God, ultimate meaning, Scripture says the word, and the English word, word, doesn't quite capture the Greek word, that is translated with the word, word. Did you follow that? I'm not even sure I followed that. The Greek word that we translate with the English word, word, that's a lot of words, is logos. Logos. And what does that Greek word mean? It means the ultimate logic or the ultimate meaning or the ultimate purpose behind everything. The logos, the meaning, the purpose, the beauty, the, 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 the logic behind everything took on a human body, a male body, born of a female body, to reveal through that male body and that female body the ultimate meaning of everything. And so we have a major clash going on in the world right now. In fact, John Paul II, two years before he became Pope, he said... We are facing the greatest clash, the greatest struggle between the word and the anti-word that we've ever known in human history. There is a clash. There is a battle. There is a war going on in the spiritual realm. But it is manifested in the body. Our bodies are meant to illuminate the meaning of our lives, the meaning of existence, the meaning of our identity. Our bodies, John Paul II says, are meant to reveal who we really are and who we are meant to be. But we don't see any of this when the body is in the dark. Right? Let's look at that line again from Jesus. If your whole body is full of light and no part of it is in darkness, then your body will be as full of light as a lamp. And that lamp, which is your body, full of light, will illuminate you with its brightness. Our bodies have been eclipsed. You know, in ancient times, before we had the scientific understanding of the universe, which has illuminated a great deal for us, right? But in ancient times, an eclipse of the sun spelled the end of the world. People literally thought the world was ending when the sun would go dark in the middle of the day. Of course, a few minutes later, the sunlight would return, and they would be spared. But it took astronomers to tell us the logic behind an eclipse so that it can happen and we don't get scared anymore. And I draw an analogy here that the body is being eclipsed. The meaning of the body in the modern world is being eclipsed. And I ask the question here on page 6, are there any astronomers out there who can explain this phenomenon of the eclipse of the body and help us understand why it has happened and if, when, and how the darkness will pass. In this short little book, I'm going to point to three astronomers, you might say, astronomers in quotes, who are going to explain for us the eclipse of the body. How long it's going to last, we don't know exactly, but we get an, an estimate here, if you will, or a kind of educated guess from three astronomers. Our Lady of Fatima, St. Paul VI and St. John Paul II. How many of you know the story of Our Lady of Fatima? Anyone here know the story? How many don't know even what I'm talking about when I say Our Lady of Fatima? Maybe it's just this Catholic phrase you hear, right? 
I remember growing up in the Catholic Church in the 70s, and my grandfather, whenever he said grace, we'd go over to you know, our grandparents' house for dinner, and whenever he said grace, he just would mumble these syllables. They just sounded like syllables to me. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for Russia. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for Russia. I didn't even know what the heck that meant. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for Russia. <laughs> but those, that little phrase, Our Lady of Fatima, pray for Russia, has taken on great meaning for me in my life. And I'm not one to go chasing after Marian apparitions. You know, I'm not one to base my face on faith, on these extraordinary phenomena that happen in the church. In fact, I'm often kind of skeptical. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Okay, that's a church-approved apparition. Okay, the church, you know what it means when the church approves an apparition? It does not mean you're obligated to believe that it actually happened. It means you are welcome to believe doesn't mean you're obligated to believe. So that's a good lesson for us all. We don't, have to, we don't have to believe in these apparitions. You can be a good Catholic and not believe in them, right? But when the church approves an apparition, she's saying, the church is saying, this is worthy of your belief. Still, I, I kind of grew up with these apparitions, heard about them, and just kind of put them to the side. And in my teenage years, I left my faith. I came back to my faith in my early 20s and largely because of St. John Paul II and his theology of the body. I'll be explaining more about that as the night goes on. But I want to enter into what Our Lady of Fatima told three shepherd children in 1917. I have come to believe firmly that this really happened. Again, I hold it out to you for your skeptical consideration. But the church says it's worthy of belief, and I have come to believe because of the events that have unfolded in the 20th and 21st century that what this woman told these three shepherd children, like it really was the mother of God. And I think if we enter in with an, at least an openness to what she predicted would happen, and then we look at what has happened, you have to at least go, huh, like that's kind of compelling, and not just kind of compelling, like it's really compelling. So let's go back to 1917. Three shepherd children. A woman appears to them, a beautiful woman from heaven. And she gave to them what's come to be known as the three secrets of Fatima. And if we look at page seven, I have them here. The first secret presented a horrifying vision of hell. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about you, but like if I were come, if I were the, I mean, I'm not, clearly. Uh, but if I were the mother of God and, and I came to appear to these three shepherd children, I think they were like seven, eight, and ten, like young kids, maybe even younger than that. I'm not sure I'd show them a vision of hell. Like, these kids had nightmares because they saw hell. I, I don't know, does that sound like a good idea to you to show little... I don't know. I, like, if, if, if Wendy and I were going to watch a movie with our kids, we wouldn't watch a movie about hell. Like, we're, our kids were, like, exposed... I don't, I don't really get it, but I'm not God, and I'm not the Blessed Mother, so I don't need to figure it out. It just seems a little weird to me. I'm just admitting that. That had nothing to do with what I really want to tell you tonight. It just came out. All right. Number two, the second secret of Fatima was a prophecy of World War II. And it contained the warning that Russia would spread her errors throughout the world. The children, they didn't know what Russia was. They had a donkey that had a name that was sort of like Russia, and they thought that the lady from heaven was saying something about their donkey. Right? This is how you know, young and innocent these children were. They had no idea that Russia was a country. They had no idea that the, the revolution was already underway in Russia. No concept of any of these things. This woman appears from heaven, tells these three shepherd children, Russia is going to spread her errors around the world. There was a third secret of Fatima that I'm not going to get into now. I'll, I'll say more about it later. But it's very important for what we're going to be talking about here tonight. How many of you already know what the third secret had to do with? A few of you. Okay. 
Good, a lot of you don't. So this is exciting for me as a storyteller because it's the third secret of Fatima that's kind of like the clincher where you're like, holy, pardon my Polish, holy shitsky, man, this is like, this is real. This really happened. Like, she predicted something that happened. And it really happened, and I lived through it as a child, and, and I'll tell you about it later. But she also said, after she said Russia would spread its errors around the world, she said, in the end, and this is the key, this is our hope, this is where I believe the culture, the world, the church is going. This is how it ends. It has a happy ending. She said, in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. Now, if you were like me, you kind of raised a Catholic, uh, Catholic schools. I did the whole Catholic school thing. These words kind of go in one ear and out the other, like triumph of the Immaculate Heart, Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. They just become like syllables, right? It's kind of like if you say the word banana like a million times, like banana, 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 banana. It's like, say it with me, like banana, 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 banana. Eventually, it's just ma ba ba You don't even know what you're saying. It's no longer connected to a reality. Right? So when we say triumph of the Immaculate Heart, or the Blessed Mother says, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. I know most people, they kind of have like, like this religious coma, and it's just like, triumph of the Immaculate Heart. Banana, 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 banana. Well, I don't even know what it means. Right? <laughs> Tonight I want to link triumph of the Immaculate Heart with the deepest desires of your heart so that you know this has something directly to do with you. With you and the deepest desires of your heart. Okay, so hold me to that, right? We're going to loop back around to that at the end of the presentation, and, and I'm really going to try to reconnect banana, 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 with the yellow fruit, so that it actually resonates in your heart, okay? Okay, here we go. We're going to go in deeper. What does it mean... Russia will spread her errors around the world. Turn the page, page 8. As most of us learned growing up in school, if you had a, like a world cultures class or studied uh, communism, the spread of communism, most of us learned that Karl Marx considered class struggle to be the defining factor of history, right? This is pretty, how many are familiar with Karl Marx and his philosophy. Most of us heard this in school, right? Class struggle defines history, but most of us don't realize that Karl Marx believed the fundamental class struggle is what we have come to call colloquially the war between the sexes. Right? Look at what it says here. Karl Marx co-wrote with Frederick Engels, he said, the first division of labor is that between man and woman for the propagation of children. And Marxist theory demands the abolition, the abolishing of the monogamous family as the fundamental unit of society. So when we hear the errors of Russia will spread around the world, we rightly think of communism, right? But that's just like the rotten fruit Communism is the rotten fruit that comes from a rotten root. And the rotten root of the whole communist error is the explicit, deliberate attempt to eliminate the distinction between male and female. This is the world we live in right now. There is an all out, deliberate, calculated attempt to remove from human consciousness the difference between male and female. And I'm going to propose to you that is the deeper error of Russia that Mary was talking about. And a lot of the world, we can kind of like if you even have faith, if you even pay attention to what Mary said in Fatima, we're like, oh yeah, communism will spread around the world, that's what she meant, and we're like, oh, we've whoo, got spared that one, here in America anyway. No, 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 no. We have swallowed the deeper error of Russia, hook, line, and sinker. 
And I want to press in here a little bit more deeply. Who knows who Sister Lucia is? Sister Lucia was one of the three visionaries. Her, her cousins, the t- two others who saw this lady from heaven in Fatima in 1917, they died soon thereafter. And Mary actually told them they would be dying fairly soon and coming to heaven. But she told Lucia that she would live a very long time. And indeed, Sister Lucia lived until February 13th. And anybody who knows the story of Fatima knows the number 13 is very significant. Right? Mary appeared on May 13th for the first time, and she appeared on the 13th of the month uh, every time she came to the children. So the number 13 is very significant. This is all symbolic stuff. But Sister Lucia died on February 13th, 2005. She lived a very long time. I think she was 97 when she died. But she said... Here's a quote from her on page 8. Sister Lucia, much later in her life, said, A time will come when the decisive battle between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of Satan will be fought over marriage and the family. And oftentimes, feminist theory, and here I mean radical feminism. There's a good kind of feminism that Catholics support and we should support. Right? But there's a radical kind of feminism that is seeking to eliminate what makes a woman a woman. Right? When feminism attacks what makes a woman a woman, this is not feminism, this is actually misogyny. Right? But listen to this. If you have the book, it's on the bottom of page 8. This comes right out of the 1970 manifesto, femi- radical feminist manifesto, which was called the dialectic of sex. Listen to this. Just as the end goal of the socialist revolution was the elimination of the economic class distinction, that's the whole Marxist theory, right? So the end goal of this radical feminist revolution must be the elimination of the sex distinction itself so that the genital difference between human beings would no longer matter culturally. So that genital difference no longer matters culturally. All right. So now we need a little biology lesson. And it's kind of even silly that we have to talk about the facts of life, right? But in the modern world, the facts of life are entirely up for grabs. Have you noticed that? We, we, we don't even, we, we need basic biology to realize why male and female exist in the first place. And, and I walk you through a little scenario here. I'm not going to read it, but I want you to imagine for a moment, you're an alien who comes from a sexless galaxy where the sexual difference does not exist. And, and you are sent to planet Earth to go study these things called human beings, And this alien, you're the alien, you witness for the first time in your alien life that there is a sexual difference. And you're asking yourself, why does this exist? Why does the sexual difference exist? And you study, you press into the whole organism of the human being. And you realize, oh my gosh, you've got these two different kinds of human beings. They're both human, they're both fully human, but they're different. But they're mostly the same. They have all the same organs, except, right? Both male and female have lungs. Both male and female have kidneys. Both male and female have eyes and ears and a nose and a mouth and a tongue and a throat and a heart and and a digestive system and a circulatory system. But wait, stop. There's a difference right there. There's this thing called a male... And they have a certain thing between their legs that the female doesn't have between her legs. Why? Inquiring minds want to know. What is this for? Do we know the answer? What do you mean by the word sex? Is sex a noun or is sex a verb? And what is the verb? And what comes first, the noun or the verb? But what is sex for? What is, what is the noun for? What is the verb for? What, why do we have differences in our genitalia? 
And why do we call them genitalia? And what do they have to do with our identity? Okay, how old are you? Just pick your number. You know how old you are. And I want to take you, let's say today's your birthday, and you're your age today. Let's go back to your birthday, and then let's go nine months before that. Thank God that your parents lived and understood the meaning of the genital difference. Because through the fact that they knew and lived the meaning of the genital difference, they united their genitals and they generated you. Now let's fast forward nine months, and maybe even before nine months, because looking at the age of some of you, uh, they had sonograms when you were in the womb. But at some point, for me, it was when the moment I was born. They didn't, that's how old I am. They didn't even have sonograms, I don't think, in the late 60s. Did they? I don't know. But my mom didn't have one. She didn't know if I was a boy or a girl. But when I was born, or maybe in your case, even before you were born with a sonogram, somebody looked at a certain part of your body to identify you. Was it your earlobe? Was it your nose? Was it your eyes? Was it your mouth? Was it your kneecaps? No, where'd they look? Someone looked at your genitals and said, it's a boy or it's a girl. Do you know it's illegal now? In many states, in the United States, it's illegal for a doctor or a technician at the sonogram or at the moment of birth to say it's a boy or it's a girl. It's becoming illegal to identify people by their genitalia. It's becoming illegal. This, this, and I'm not, I'm not saying this to wag fingers at people. I'm not saying this to shame people. I'm not saying it to scold anybody. But I'm saying it because our bodies are in the dark. In fact, we don't want them to come into the light. We're afraid to bring our bodies into the light. And so often the very parts of our body that remain in the dark are our genitalia. What does Jesus say? That no part of your body would remain in the, in the dark. He wants our whole body and every part of our body to come into the light. Because if our body is in the dark, Jesus says, if the light in you is darkness, how dark will the darkness be? the darkness will become a total eclipse where we lose sight of who we really are. So I'm not saying this to shame anybody who might be confused about being male or female. I'm not saying this to, to scold anybody who might suffer with gender dysphoria where you have an interior experience that doesn't seem to match your body. I can only imagine the, the deep, painful struggle that is but I just want to hold this out as a proposal. Why do we think that if there is a disconnect between the experience of body and soul, why do we think in the modern world that the solution is to change the body rather than to heal the soul? Clearly there's a disconnect and clearly a healing is needed. But we have lost faith that a healing of the soul is possible, so we turn to science, we turn to technology, we turn to surgeries that actually amount to bodily mutilation to solve a spiritual problem. If there is a disconnect in a person's experience of body and soul, then obviously something needs to be healed. Why do we injure the body expecting that this is going to heal the person. Christ holds out to us another solution to the problem. It's called the redemption of the whole human being, body and soul. The redemption of the whole human being, body and soul. All of that was just a little rabbit trail I went down to try to answer the question, why is there a genital difference? What is that alien discovering? The alien from the sexless galaxy is discovering that male and female are literally 
organized for one another. What does that mean? What does it mean to be organized for one another? It means that we have the organs that allow us to become one organism, one functioning organism. We have the organs that allow us to become one functioning organism. That's what it means that male and female are organized for each other. Think about it. I am complete in every part and function of my body except one. My lungs work all by themselves. My circulatory system works all by itself. My digestive system works all by itself. But my genital or reproductive system does not work by itself. In fact, by itself, it makes zero sense. Every cell in my body has 46 chromosomes except one. My sperm cells. How many chromosomes do, do, do my sperm cells have? 23, 23, 23. Every cell in a woman's body has 46 chromosomes except one. Her ova. The ovum has how many cells? How many, excuse me, how many chromosomes? Sorry. How many chromosomes in the ova? 23. Hey, check out the math on that one. 23 in the sperm and 23 in the ova add up to? We are made for one another, right? And this is where our bodies are being eclipsed. The fundamental, and I'm just talking at the natural level here, the fundamental reason for the sexual difference, for genital distinction, is the union of genitals to generate the next generation. And guess what? That's where we get the word gender. Before the modern world deconstructed the language, before the modern world started changing the definition of words, look at that Greek root it's, that's in the word gender, gen. That Greek root, you'll find it in other words like generous, generate, progeny, genealogy, genetics, genitals, gen. What does it mean? The Greek root, it means to produce, to give birth to. Until the modern world started redefining our terms, the word gender has always meant the manner in which you generate new life. The manner in which you generate new life. Males generate new life with sperm. Females generate new life with ova. That's how new life is generated. Right? And the manner in which you generate new life is determined by your genitals. This is why someone looked at your genitals and said, it's a boy or it's a girl. Eyes are meant for seeing, right? Let me back up here before I even go down this list. But suppose I were on some national talk show like... Uh, I don't know, pick a, pick a national talk show. What? Oprah? She's not, she doesn't even have a show anymore. Who's... who's uh, I, all right, say, say I was on uh, the, I don't know, Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, all right? And Jimmy Fallon and I were having a conversation, and I said, Jimmy, tell me if this is controversial. Eyes are meant for seeing. Do you think Jimmy Fallon would put up any stink if I said that? How about if I said, ears are meant for hearing? Any stink there? How about lungs are meant for breathing? Any stink there? How about if I said, genitals are meant for generating children? They probably cut to commercial break. People don't want to hear this anymore. What in the modern world has afforded the disconnect between genitals and generating children? Can you think of anything that has afforded a disconnect here? What's that? Contraception. Contraception. My brothers and sisters, if we want to understand what's going on in the world today with gender confusion, 
with the eclipse of the body, with the fact that we have totally lost an understanding of what the basic purpose and meaning of the sexual difference is, we must take an honest look at the issue of contraception. If we don't look honestly at contraception, we cannot understand what's going on in the world today. Contraception is, is what has blinded us to the meaning of the sexual difference. Right? Put it this way. If the fundamental meaning of the genital difference is generating children, then insert contraception into that picture and eventually we're going to lose sight of the fundamental meaning of the gender difference. And people will end up saying strange things like, I got pregnant by accident. W were you having sex? Well, well yes, but the, the condom broke, or I forgot to take my pill. The, mo the modern world is blaming pregnancy not on the choice to engage in genital intercourse, but on failed contraception. Right? As Dr. Janet Smith likes to say, if you were having sex and you got pregnant, it does not mean something went wrong. It means something went beautifully right. But when we're wearing condom-colored glasses, we see a pregnancy as a mistake. We see a pregnancy as an accident. We see it as something I didn't want to happen. Here's some history. Many people do not know this history. Up until 1930, every Christian denomination across the board recognized the immorality of contraception and recognized that when we render the sexual act sterile, it's the beginning of the end of marriage and family life in a culture. In 1930, the Anglican Church was the first church to change its teaching and say in the most limited circumstances, married couples might be justified in rendering their sexual act sterile. They gave a, like they just opened the door a crack. And there is a global backlash. There is a global backlash. Let me read to you some of the things that people were saying about a hundred years ago with regard to contraception. A lot of people don't, don't know this history. Listen to this. This is on page 15, if you're following along. Actually, let's go to page 14. This is Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was no friend of religion. But look what he said here. The abandonment, bottom of page 14, the abandonment of the reproductive function is the common feature of all perversions. We actually describe a sexual activity as perverse, he said, if it has given up the aim of reproduction and pursues the attainment of pleasure as an aim independent of reproduction. That's Sigmund Freud. Listen to this from Theodore Roosevelt. He condemned contraception as a serious threat against the welfare of the nation, describing it as, quote, the one sin for which the penalty is national death, race death, a sin for which there is no atonement. Now, I don't agree with that. There's an atonement for all our sins. But what did Theodore Roosevelt understand that we in the modern world simply have lost sight of? It's kind of eye-opening, isn't it? Listen to what Gandhi said. Gandhi insisted that contraceptive methods are like putting a premium on vice. They make men and women reckless. He predicted that nature will have full revenge for any such violation of her laws. Moral results can only be produced by moral restraints, he said. Hence, if contraceptive methods become the order of the day, nothing but moral degradation can be the result. As it is, man has sufficiently degraded woman for his lust. And contraception, no matter how well-meaning the advocates may be, will still further degrade women. 
You know what I think is going on with the huge spike in teenage girls who hate being female? I think one of the big reasons for this is that they are being exposed to porn. And they see how women are treated violently in porn. My wife and I have a podcast. Uh, any, any listeners to our podcast out there? It's called the Ask Christopher West Podcast. You're going to leave tonight, I'm sure, with more questions going out than you had coming in. There's over 130 episodes, and we, we answer a lot, a lot of questions. So you can tune in there. But we just got a question a few weeks ago in which a woman wrote to us. It was so sad. And she had been terribly, terribly sexually abused, and she had concluded, it's too dangerous to be a woman. I don't want to be a woman anymore. Nor do I wish that I were a man because of how they treat women. We have come to a kind of hatred of our bodies and our sexuality and the sexual difference itself because we think in the modern world that pornography is the frame for understanding sex. Well, brothers and sisters, pornography is the diabolic mockery of God's plan for sex. Satan is after our sexuality. The enemy hates our sexuality. Why? Because our sexuality reveals we are made in the image and likeness of God. And he hates God, and he hates God's image. The scripture says that Satan fell out of envy. Let's press into that a little bit. Envy is not just jealousy. Jealousy says, I wish I had what you had. But envy goes a step further and says, I hate that you have it, and I want you to hate that you have it. So Lucifer was created by God as the, the most glorious angel. Right? He was good. Everything God created is good, and Lucifer was a creature of God. Lucifer means angel of light. But he fell out of envy. What do we have that angels don't have? Bodies. And what can we do with our bodies that angels cannot do? We can participate in God's act of generation. God is eternally generating the Son. Not in a sexual way, right? God is beyond the difference of the sexes. God's not sexual, but our sexuality images the inner life of the Trinity. And what is the image of the, what is the inner life of the Trinity, and how do we image it? God is love, right? Well, what does that mean? It means God's love is generous. God's love generates from all eternity. The Father is generating the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. God's love is generous. God's love generates, and this is why God gave us genitals. So we could image his generous, generating love. But a culture that fails to respect the fact that genitals are meant to generate will inevitably be a culture that degenerates. It was predicted in 1930 that if contraception becomes the order of the day, we will see an increase in adultery. We will see an increase in divorce. We will see an increase in promiscuous, out-of-wedlock sex. We see, we'll see an increase in fatherless children. We will see an increase in abortion. We will see an increase in the crime, the drugs, the poverty, the psychological illnesses that come from fatherless children. Now, of course, God can make up when, when our father has abandoned us, or maybe our father has died, or whatever the case may be. Grace can make up for these things. There's no doubt about it. But a culture of fatherless children is a culture of crime, drugs, poverty, homelessness, 
all manner of social ills. It was predicted that if contraception becomes the order of the day, we will see an increase in sexually transmitted diseases. It was predicted that if contraception becomes the order of the day, eventually homosexuality will be normalized. It was predicted that if contraception becomes the order of the day, eventually we will lose all sense and understanding of the meaning and purpose of the sexual difference, and men and women will think gender is malleable and fluid. All of this was predicted in 1930. The promoters of contraception scoffed at these predictions and said it will never happen. We're doing this to build up and safeguard marriages from the stress of too many children. Okay, has that happened? Has those, have those predictions come to pass? This is the world we live in right now. This is not an apocalyptic prediction of some horrific future. This is the world we're in right now. How is it that contraception got us here? I'm going to show you the inner logic, admitting, of course, it's more complex than this, but once you see the inner logic, you can't deny the role contraception has played. Are you ready? Here we go. Men and women are often tempted to do things we shouldn't do, right? We know this in human experience. For example, what would happen to crime rates in New York City if there were no police? They'd go up, right? Let's apply the same logic to sexual activity. What is it that orients sexual, sexual activity towards a noble goal? Fertility. That orients our sexual activity towards self-sacrificial behavior, towards fidelity in marriage. When we understand that sex leads to babies... We understand who should be having sex and who shouldn't be having sex. When we rejoice in the fact that sex leads to babies, who should be having sex? Every civilization that has ever flourished, flourished because it embraced and upheld the truth that sex leads to babies, and the cultural norms pro protected the fact that sex leads to babies, and therefore said, only those people who are committed to raising those babies should be having sex. And that commitment is called marriage. Remove fertility from the sexual equation and eventually all hell breaks loose. Now, adultery is nothing new, but throughout human history, what has been the main deterrent from committing adultery? Pregnancy has been the main deterrent from committing adultery. What would happen in a culture if you removed that deterrent with widespread availability and promotion of contraception? What's going to happen to rates of adultery? Boom. Have they? They sure have. What's one of the main causes of divorce? Adultery. It gets much worse. Apply the same logic to premarital sex. Nothing new under the sun. There's always been premarital sex, but we've never seen it like we see it today. Why? Because the main deterrent throughout human history from premarital sex was pregnancy. Take away the deterrent, what's going to happen to rates of premarital sex? Boom. What's going to happen in a culture where there are huge rates of increase in adultery, huge rates of increase in premarital sex, and these men and women have already determined by the choice of using contraception that they do not want this act to result in a child? There's a problem here because no method of contraception is 100% effective. So what's going to start happening? Women are going to get pregnant and consider it an accident. I didn't want this to happen, so what's going to come next? Abortion. So many people think that the way you solve the abortion problem is by getting more contraception out there. My brothers and sisters, take a deeper look. That's like throwing gasoline on a fire to try to put it out. In the final analysis, there's one reason we have abortion. Because men and women are having sex who are not open to the gift of children. That's why we have abortion. It gets worse. Sorry to say, but it gets worse. Not every woman who gets pregnant and didn't want to be will give up or will uh, abort her child. Thanks be to God. Right? Most women will raise these children by themselves. 
Women are, of single mothers are the heroes of the culture of life. They are the heroes. But they are also the first to admit that something isn't right in this picture. I'm raising these children by myself. Right? Here's a very important truth. Women alone get pregnant, but they never get pregnant alone. Women alone get pregnant, but they never get pregnant alone. Where are the men who have fathered these children and then said, see ya? This is what Gandhi meant when he said, if contraception becomes the order of the day, no matter how well-meaning the advocates may be, contraception will do nothing but further degrade women. And women have gotten to the point where they are demanding as a right, the right to kill their babies to claim equality with men. I'm not saying this to wag fingers. I'm not saying this to scold anybody or shame anybody. I'm saying it to turn the lights on so we can bring our bodies and every part of our bodies out of the darkness and into the light so that our bodies can illuminate who we are, how we are to live, why we are here, what our ultimate destiny is, and how we get there. Because the human body was designed by God to reveal ultimate meaning. And there is an enemy who is attacking the fundamental meaning of the sexual difference because he doesn't want us to come into the light, because he doesn't want us to reach our destiny. It gets much worse. These children being raised by women, single mothers, God bless them, they're the heroes, as I said, but it's going to be a huge increase in fatherless children, which has already been hugely increased by increases in adultery, which has led to increases in divorce. Fatherless children is going to lead to the, a world of all that I listed earlier. All kinds of social ills get traced back to fatherless children. But it gets even worse than this. There's a great quote in here. Not great as in wonderful, but great as in, oh my gosh, very insightful. Turn to page 31 if you have your, or is it 21? My eyes don't work. 21. Turn to page 21. We're going to bring this plane in for a landing very soon here, and I'm going to get Mike to come up here and sing for us. But don't forget, I have to connect the triumph of the Immaculate Heart with the deepest desires of your heart. 72 years, this is page 21, the second paragraph, 72 years after the 1930 Anglican Church decision to accept contraception, the head archbishop of the Anglican Church, his name was Rowan Williams, observed that the absolute condemnation of same-sex relations has nothing substantial to rely upon in a church that accepts the legitimacy of contraception. He was correct, but rather than question the legitimacy of contraception, he took that as a given and justified homosexual behavior. If we are being logically consistent, it has to be one or the other. Let me point something out to you here, and again, please hear my heart. I am not saying this to wag fingers at anyone who has same-sex attraction. This is part of the fallen world we live in. This is part of our broken humanity. We are all sexually broken. No one on the planet is not sexually broken. It's the inheritance of original sin. It is okay that we are sexually broken because there's a solution. It's called the redemption of the body. But it is not okay to call our sexual brokenness health. It is not okay to call our sexual brokenness the way God made us. List any sexual, any manifestation of sexual brokenness. Looking at porn, masturbating, premarital sex, lustful sex of any kind, where you're treating another human being as an object for your selfish pleasure, whether it's the same sex or the opposite sex, I don't care. That is a sexual distortion and a sexual disorder. It's sexual brokenness when we look at other human beings as objects for our selfish pleasure. It was never meant to be this way. And we can say with any sexual brokenness, we can quote Jesus who said, In the beginning it was not so. 
And here's the good news of the gospel that John Paul II proclaimed so powerfully in his theology of the body. Jesus came into the world to restore creation to the purity of its origins. To the purity of its origins. When man and woman were naked and felt no shame. Because their entire body and every part of it was in the light of God. And they desired nothing in the light of God other than to love in the image of God. Something has gone wrong in our sexuality. It's okay because there's a solution. But don't call what has gone wrong the way God made you. Redemption is a truth, a reality, John Paul II says, in the name of which we must feel called with power. Called to rediscover who we really are as men and women made in the image of God. Let me point something out to you here, and I need both hands. When we understand what a man and a woman can do with their genitals and what they're called to do, generate the next generation, we recognize, everyone can recognize, when we hold this high standard as to the meaning of the genital difference, it is impossible, absolutely impossible, to raise to this level what two men or two women might do with their genitals. It's impossible. However... It is not impossible to lower what a man and a woman are doing with their genitals to the same level as what two men or two women are doing with theirs. Pursuing sterile pleasure. And when the secular culture says these two things are equal, they're the same thing. You know the slogans like love is love. The secular culture is right in as much as we have lowered what men and women are doing to this level, the pursuit of sterile pleasure. And the secular world, because it's wearing condom-colored glasses and has lowered the male-female relationship to the pursuit of sterile pleasure, the secular culture is correct in its own logic when it says these two things are the same thing. That's why I say it is impossible to understand what's going on in the world today without understanding the role that contraception has played. Maybe, and I hold this out as a proposal to you, I'm not here to be a big downer or a big heavy here, I hold it out to you as a proposal. Maybe, just maybe, The Catholic Church is who Jesus said it really is. His bride. The bride that was promised the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, he promised, would lead the church into all truth. And the church would be commissioned by the Holy Spirit to teach the truth in season and out of season. And so I hold out to you as a proposal... Maybe the Catholic Church isn't crazy after all in her teaching on contraception. In 1968, when St. Paul VI wrote his encyclical letter, Humanae Vitae, of human life, he reaffirmed what the Catholic Church has always understood about contraception, that it damages marital love, that it is not part of God's plan, that it blinds us to the true meaning of sexuality. And on the top of page 14, I have four predictions that Paul VI made in 1968. He said, if contraception becomes the order of the day, we will see an, an increase in rampant infidelity. And we will come to have a world where women and childbearing are degraded. He said, we will have a world in which governments trample on the rights and needs of the family. And we will have a world in which human beings believe they can manipulate their bodies at will. How did he know that? How did he know that was going to happen? Maybe he was led by the Holy Spirit. Okay. I close with this. May 13th, 1981. Pope John Paul II was driving into St. Peter's Square. 
And he was driving into St. Peter's Square in the middle of his Theology of the Body catechesis. Up to that point, he had already delivered about, in fact, I know the exact math, he had delivered 63 of the 129 Wednesday audience addresses that made up his Theology of the Body. And on that day, May 13th, 1981, he was about to announce to the world the establishment of the Pontifical Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family, which was going to be his arm for spreading the theology of the body around the world. What is the theology of the body? It is heaven's antidote to the error of Russia. That's what it is. I am a proud graduate of the Pontifical Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family. I owe the work that I do spreading theology of the body around the world to that institute. Before John Paul II could announce the establishment of that institute, an assassin named Ali Atka pulled out his gun and shot at point-blank range, aiming to kill the Pope. John Paul II was spared death by millimeters. And later, John Paul II would say, one hand pulled the trigger and another hand guided the bullet. And he believed the hand that guided the bullet was Our Lady of Fatima. When he was recovering in his hospital bed, he asked his private secretary to bring to him an envelope that was in the archives in the Vatican containing the third secret of Fatima. John Paul would not reveal to the world what the third secret of Fatima was until the year 2000. But recovering in his hospital bed a few days after being shot by a would-be assassin on the feast day of Our Lady of Fatima, John Paul in the hospital bed reads the third secret of Fatima and it says that Mary revealed to these three children in 1917 a vision of a bishop dressed in white getting gunned down by bullets and arrows. This is where you gotta go, pardon my Polish again, holy shitsky. You can't make this up. You can't make this up. But she predicted after the world passed through this great time of darkness in which the body and the meaning of the gender difference would be eclipsed, she predicted the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. What does that mean and what does it have to do with you? Who knows what the first words in the mouth of Jesus are in the Gospel of John? Follow all of these rules or you're going to hell. Nope, this is not the Jesus we believe in. The very first thing Jesus says in the Gospel of John is this. What do you want? What do you want? Jesus did not come to squash the desires of our heart. He came to awaken them in their fullness. And that ache that we all feel, that yearning we all feel for love, for joy, for happiness, for fulfillment, that ache, that fire inside, that yearning, that hunger, that thirst we all feel for something, in the words of the prophet Bruce Springsteen, everybody's got a hungry heart. That hunger has a name, and I learned its name from John Paul II. He calls it in his Theology of the Body, Eros, E-R-O-S. What English word do we get from that Greek word, eros? Erotic. In my mind, when I first read that, I was 24 years old, and in my mind at the time, the erotic was synonymous with the pornographic, and that's exactly what the enemy wants us to think. And John Paul II said to me, and I felt like he was talking right to my heart, Christopher, no, 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 you're getting it all wrong. Do not confuse the word eros with another Greek word, porneia. Porneia is the enemy's diabolic twisting and distortion of eros. And then I read words that changed my life. He said, Christ does not want us to repress eros. 
Christ wants to redeem Eros. Christ wants us to experience, and this is a direct quote from John Paul II, Christ wants us to experience the fullness of Eros, which means the upward impulse of the human spirit towards everything true, good, and beautiful, so that what is erotic might also be true, good, and beautiful. Here's my analogy to explain what the Pope is saying. And here's why the triumph of the Immaculate Heart has everything to do with you and what you really want. I like to say God gave us erotic desire to be like the fuel of a rocket that has the power to launch us to the stars, to infinity and beyond. But you see, there's an enemy who doesn't want us to reach the stars. And so with original sin, our rocket engines became inverted. That's an impure heart. That's a maculate heart. A, a maculate heart is the same as an impure heart. An immaculate heart is the same as a pure heart. And a pure heart is a heart that is aimed at ultimate fulfillment. The union of love that awaits us in heaven, that's an immaculate heart. A heart that has opened Eros to an infinite fulfillment. What is the triumph of the Immaculate Heart? It's the triumph of purity of heart. What is purity of heart? John Paul II says, Purity of heart is the revelation of the beauty and goodness of God through the human body, through the sexual difference. What is the triumph of the Immaculate Heart? It's the redemption of masculinity and femininity. It's when our bodies come into the light so that our bodies reveal, as they were always meant to reveal, who we really are and who God really is and how, why we're here and how we are to live and how we are to love and what our ultimate destiny is and how to get there. My brothers and sisters, John Paul II has given us the antidote to the crisis of our times in his theology of the body. But if you have the antidote in your hands and you don't inject it into your bloodstream, it's not going to do you any good. I, I, I invite you to consider taking up a study of what John Paul has given us. Just begin with that little booklet that I've given you. That's a great little introduction. Consider taking a course from the Theology of the Body Institute. We have online courses. We have in-person courses. Just three hours from here in Pennsylvania, we do these five-day intensive courses. It'll rock your world and change your life. Consider coming on a pilgrimage with us. We do pilgrimages around the world where we dive deeply in, at these holy sites. We dive deeply into John Paul's Theology of the Body. We're going to Mexico City in December for Our Lady of Guadalupe. We're going to see the tilma. And we're going to talk about how the tilma brought 15 million people into the church in the middle of a culture not unlike our own, where there was horrific sexual violence and death. 15 million people were converted and came into the church through the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Consider coming with us on pilgrimage in December to enter into that mystery. My brothers and sisters, I'm going to invite Mike up to sing a song for us that's going to, I hope, summarize some of the themes of what I'm trying to present to you tonight in this sense. I believe we're standing at a threshold. We're standing at the gate of this triumph. And we're being invited through this gate into a whole new way of seeing, a whole new way of thinking about our bodies a way that our bodies will come into the light and no part of our body will remain in darkness. If you, like me, have grown up looking at porn, you, like me, you are desperately in need of a healing of your mind and your heart. If you have been wounded like I've been wounded by promiscuous sexual experiences as a teenager and a young adult, you're in need of healing like I'm in need of healing. And we can walk through this gate into healing. One of the lines of the song, Mike says, we've been poisoned and we've been used, but we're standing at this gate and we can enter through. At the end of this song, 
Mike's going to open his heart in, in, and he's going to give voice to this cry, to this hungry heart that we all have, to this anguished pain that we all feel. And I invite you, as Mike gives voice to this anguished cry and yearning, to give yourself permission to feel the anguished cry and yearning of your own heart and open it to the one who put that yearning in your heart to launch you like a rocket to the stars. These are times of darkness, yes, but the darker it gets, the brighter the light shines. And when it is as dark as dark can be, give it three days. What happened three days after the darkest day in human history? Christ was raised from the dead on a Sunday, sun day, the light returns. The eclipse happened on the Friday when Christ was nailed. Oh, 